You probably heard of Thomas Cromwell in any of Henry VIII's reenactments, possibly Wolsey and maybe more. They were Henry VIII's right-hand men and the most powerful individuals next to the king himself. In this video, I recreate their portraits to see how they might have looked in real life, as well as talk about what their deals were. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Here on Mortal Faces, I take historic portraits and transform them to see how individuals we read about might have looked in real life, as well as I talk a little bit about them. So let's get started. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more historical recreations, and let me know in the comments who you'd like to see in real life. Thomas Cromwell was the chief minister to Henry VIII. A modern translation would be like his prime minister. He was born to a man of many skills. His father William was a yeoman, which was a middle-class social rank in medieval England. He was a fuller and a cloth merchant and owned an inn and brewery. He might have also been educated in the skill of blacksmithing. It is said his mother came from a recognized gentry family, so they were neither rich nor poor, noble nor ruined, but dutiful community members. He had a really modern lifestyle that we can be familiar with today. A really adventurous 20s and then you settle down in your 30s. In his youth, Thomas was untamed and a ruffian. You can imagine a young man, fearless, full of life, who wasn't scared of getting into trouble. One story stuck was that he left his home as a young teenager and set sail to the continent to become a mercenary or a page to a soldier. And that's where he learned his education, languages, and network of contacts. He ended up in Italy, served a banker, and also stayed with merchants in the Low Countries. In 1515, about the age of 30, he was back in England and married Elizabeth Wicks. Their home was harmonious and prosperous, and they had three kids. However, she died when his career really started to take off. He became a successful merchant that his ancestors would be proud, but like his father, was not content to follow just one career path, so made a flip to open his own law practice. And that's how he entered politics. While maintaining his private legal practice, he gained a seat in the House of Commons and then became a trusted advisor to a Marquis, who happened to be Lady Jane's grandfather. He then became a member of Cardinal Wolsey's household. Thomas Wolsey was the cardinal during most of Henry VIII's reign. His position allowed him to proceed over all other English clergy. He was an extremely powerful man and became the controlling figure in virtually all matters of state. He was born in 1473, so about 12 years before Thomas Cromwell, and he too came from a modest background. His father was a butcher and he had a more traditional upbringing, what we call elementary school, high school, and then university. He went to Oxford to study theology. He started as a priest in Wiltshire, then became Dean of Divinity at Oxford. He then became a rector and following this, a chaplain to the Archbishop of Canterbury. From that position, he was taken into the household of Sir Richard Nanfan, who made Wolsey executor of his estate. But then he died in 1507, and Wolsey would have been about 34, so we entered the service of King Henry VII. Henry VII was much more humble than his son Henry VIII and was willing to favor those of much more humble backgrounds. He became the royal chaplain and served under the bishop and lord privy seal. Then, when Henry VIII got the throne, Wolsey became almoner, which gave him seat on the privy council. Honestly, he just got the position because Henry at the time was young and wasn't too interested in the details of government in his early reign. What made Wolsey stand out was that he adapted his views to the kings and gave persuasive speeches to the Privy Council. To maintain his position, Wolsey privately made decisions to destroy or neutralize other courtiers' influences. This caught Henry VIII's attention and eventually in 1515, when he was 42, became a Lord Chancellor, the king's chief advisor and basically the highest position next to the king. Parallel to this, his religious position rose too. He became a canon of Windsor, and then a bishop, and finally cardinal in 1515. So basically, by 1515, aged 42, he had both the king and the church wrapped around his little fingers. Wolsey made Thomas Cromwell his senior and most trusted advisor, but then Wolsey's powers suddenly fell. It was around 1529 that Henry VIII wanted to annul his marriage from Catherine of Aragon, so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Well, Wolsey had a lot of enemies at court who did not like this commoner having so much power and riches. 
Anne was one of them and she dripped into Henry's ear that Wolsey was deliberately slowing the proceedings. As a result, he was arrested and stripped of his positions. You can see why Henry was so anxious on my recreation video on him, the link's in the description. Wolsey was allowed to stay Archbishop of York though, but on his way to York, he got called back because he was accused of treason. Fortunately for him, he died on the trip from natural causes. He was 57 in 1530. Thomas Cromwell, being so close to Wolsey, had to do a lot of damage control to his reputation. Instead of backing away though, he defended himself and stood his ground, and this received much admiration. Wolsey was then replaced by Thomas More. Unlike Wolsey and Cromwell, who came from humble backgrounds, Moore came from a wealthy family. His father was a successful lawyer and judge. His grandfather was a baker, but his grandmother was an heiress of a London brewery whose own grandfather was a chancellor. Needless to say, he was afforded the best education at London's best school. He was a straight-A student and had a strong gift for spiritual learning. But despite his wish to practice theology, his father insisted, in fact, removed him early on from university to go straight into a law career, like him. He contemplated on becoming a monk many times, but eventually made up his mind to continue his law career. So he married and had four kids. His wife died, so he married again. He inherited stepkids, and for each of his children, he was really, really invested in their education. Even his daughters. He made them into some of the most educated women in England. Any subject his sons learned, he made sure his daughters learned too. With his law and political career, he was elected to the House of Commons for Great Yarmouth, and then London in 1510. Eventually, he became a privy councillor, accompanying Thomas Wolsey, and after that, under-treasurer, and finally secretary and advisor to the king. Basically, when Wolsey died, Moore got his position and became Lord Chancellor. As Lord Chancellor, his religious views were quite radical and harsh. He himself practiced asceticism, which is the denial of physical or psychological desires in order to obtain a spiritual ideal or goal. Basically, he chose to wear a very coarse shirt that irritated the skin and flogged himself on a regular basis for penance. With this strong viewpoint and seeing the Protestant Reformation as heresy, he is noted for burning many heretics, torturing, and killing them. Moore accepted the queenship of Anne Boleyn, but not the spiritual validity of the king's second marriage. Also, he publicly refused to uphold the annulment from Catherine of Aragon, and lastly, he refused to uphold the supremacy of the crown, keeping the pope ahead of the king. And this made many arguments with the king, but he managed to stay in favor a while longer because he kept his opinions to himself. He agreed what the law would allow him to agree on, but anything spiritually was another story. To no surprise, he was in office for only three years before resigning. In the end, he refused to sign the oath of loyalty that went against his spiritual beliefs regarding the king's new powers, so was accused of treason. Thomas Cromwell made several visits to his prison to persuade him to sign and acknowledge this, but his defense was, although he had not taken the oath, he had never spoken out against it either. He was beheaded and died in 1535, aged 57. So the last man standing and the king's most important advisor was none other than Thomas Cromwell. He spent the next few years fortifying the king's new status as head of the Church of England. His power rose significantly as Henry saw him as a true ally, and for a while he really did everything the king wanted, including putting together the plan for Henry's famous dissolution of the monasteries and getting rid of Anne Boleyn. But with all this power came a lot of enemies, and his enemies were patiently waiting for a crack to appear. Oddly enough, that crack was with Anne of Cleves, Henry's fourth wife. I have a video on her to see what she might have looked like in real life, but apparently she was kind of ugly and smelly. Henry didn't like her, but it was Cromwell who set them up. And when this embarrassing moment happened and Henry was like, I'm sorry, I can't be near you, Miss Cleves, you're so repulsive, his enemies pounced. They used that as a basis and then embellished it with a whole bunch of other accusations. Henry, feeling confused and hurt by this sense of humiliation and betrayal, believed all the accusations. You see, it took little to ignite the suspicions of this aging and paranoid king. Cromwell was stripped of his power, titles, and riches. 
He was beheaded in 1540, about 54, 55 years old. It took three blows of the axe by the ragged and butchery executioner to sever his head. Perhaps the most compelling assessment of Cromwell was that by Henry VIII himself, within just a few short weeks of his chief minister's demise, the king was heard to lament the loss of the most faithful servant he had ever had. And that's just a little bit about Thomas Cromwell, Wolsey, and more. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching, subscribe for more historical recreations. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow and it allows me to continue making more content for you. It's the best way to support me. Let me know in the comments who you'd like to see in real life, I do make a list of all your suggestions, and I will see you in the next one.